The scripture this morning is really obvious to me. This is just Romans 2. Paul's writing to the Romans. This is one little verse. I put the NIV, but I looked up the New Revised Standard Version that I usually use, and it's almost identical. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That is just like the essence of the PBS series. Now, they don't look at it from a spiritual way. They look at it from the scientific way. But we are conforming to the patterns of this world. And we have to renew our minds. We have to take off the veil to test and approve what God's will is. We have to give it a second glance. I love the, now the message goes crazy with this scripture, but I love what it does. It gets into the meat of it. <clears throat> Where that scripture fit on one screen, the message, it takes three screens of words to get the whole point across. So here goes. This is their interpretation of what Paul was saying. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants, she wants, from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings out the best of you, brings the best out of you and develops well-formed maturity in you. Mm. You are not quite who you think you are, and neither is anybody else. We all like to imagine that we know why we make the decisions that we do. What to buy, where to eat, who to vote for, but scientists discovered that we make most of our decisions so fast, we're not even aware of it. And most of the time, we're operating on autopilot. And this PBS series addresses police biases. You know, why is it that white people get treated different from people of color? How we form habits, why we're so drawn to this Republican or Democrat in our politics, where our personal biases come from, and how we're influenced by our social circles. So this, um, I'm going to show you, I call this my monkey video. Okay. This is a little snippet from one of the episodes of the PBS series, but it, it's why I keep saying we're using our monkey minds. So let's Learn a little bit about monkeys. To find the answer, Rory Santos is taking us to a unique place, Monkey Island off the coast of Puerto Rico. Every other monkey is a them to be 
fear or attack. So what we're seeing right now is a monkey feeding crowd. This is a spot where they get their main food on the island, which is monkey chow. One of the bigger groups on the island is in the crowd right now, and one of the smaller groups is coming up and trying to make a decision of whether or not to go in. And there's a lot at stake. There are moms holding their babies whose babies can get into the fray if they make the wrong decision. Um, there are little kids who don't have support. And look, look at what we're seeing right now. This is one group of our hands. The group of our hands has to make a split decision. Are they going to run out or are they going to hang out in here? Is there enough of my crowd here? To back me up if, if bad things happen. You hear a little chaos here. It's time to go in and see these other people who are flying out right here. Lots of screaming and screaming is in part because you know, this is a dangerous time to be. Of course, our autopilot system is much more sophisticated than that of these ones. But according to Sanos, that simply enables us to think even more in terms of us versus them than these monkeys can. We are constantly making decisions based on language. You know, we use labels for who's in our group. We have words for different race individuals, different genders. You know, I'm wearing my yell cap here signaling which university I'm from. Right, and, and I have my donut shop hat on. So it's like, <laughs> you know, a yeah. But we use markers all the time. We call ourselves American. We call ourselves white or black. We call ourselves gay or straight. I'm not talking to folks when I'm walking around the city to ask them, well, which group are you in? But I quickly know who's of a different gender, who's of a different race. I'm picking up on those distinctions and kind of be fast. So it's not an accident that we humans tend to see the world through the lens of our us versus them biases. It's an ancient autopilot instinct. And that's why, as numerous studies have shown, we're most likely to believe disinformation that triggers primal emotions like fear and anger toward another group of human beings. This autopilot that they mentioned. It is that first gaze? It's that monkey reflex. Uh, how will the you know our first our body is saying how will this affect me? How does my self image demand that I react to this? How can I get back in control of the situation? That's our very first thought. Our ego is part of our autopilot, and we do things for those reasons. And. Um, just one of the things we could talk about is slowing down and reflecting. Not letting your autopilot brain tell you always what to do and to be more contemplative. And you say, well, I don't know about contemplation. That sounds like some fancy thing that people do. But here's a quote by Gerald May says, contemplation happens to everyone. It'll happen to you in moments when you're open, undefended, and immediately present. If you can help those things to happen, then you can contemplate your situation. When you're open, you're not being, you're undefended and you're immediately present to the situation, then you can, um, you can be contemplative. It doesn't require some special uh, skill set or some fancy seminary degree to be contemplative. It just says, be open, be undefended, and immediately present to your situation, and you can be contemplative. Richard Rohr said this week, he said, even after 50 years of practicing contemplation, his immediate response to most situations is defensiveness, judgment, control, and analysis. 
he admits that he's better at calculating than he is contemplating. And he suggests that a good New Year's practice for us would be to admit that and start there. That if we can admit the false self seems to have a first gaze at almost everything. He says that on his better days, when he's open, undefended, and immediately present, he can sometimes begin the day with a contemplative mind and heart. Sometimes he can get there later and even in there, but it usually requires a second gaze. The second gaze is comes through contemplating it, it comes through prayer, it comes through solitude and silence and compassion. And what will happen is we will move to act more for peace and justice. And I compare it to the reverse prayer that we did this morning. Our normal, what we've been doing since we started worship, is we've been concerned about ourselves because we're living through a COVID time. And so we were praying for inner peace and throw out the bad. And I'm gonna take in the good and give out the bad. And this morning I ask you to take in the bad and give out the good. Take in the bad and give out the good. And that's a reverse. If you slow down and take a second look, Compassion is going to move you to act for more peace and justice than what your very first, uh, what your first instincts, what your ego says that you need to do. The true self is always ridden and blinded by the defensive needs of your separate self, your ego. It is an hour by hour video. There, there's nobody who has complete control over this on their own. So all spiritual traditions, not just Christianity, but all spiritual traditions insist that you return to prayer throughout the day. And there's a reason for that. Why, why we have uh, a blessing um, on, on morning, noon, and night, and why we have evening prayer, and before we go to bed prayer. Otherwise, we're going to fall right back into this autopilot, this cruise control of the small personal self-interest. But the easiest way for me, the thing from the whole video series that stuck in my head and helped me to understand it better, is driving. How hard it is, stressful. I'll tell you, the trip to Oklahoma and back to us was stressful because you're unfamiliar with everything. You're going on roads you've never driven on before. You're in situations that you've never been in before. So there's no relaxing. There's no autopilot. And it really pulls your energy out. In my commute out to Amelia four or five days a week, I put it on autopilot, and I know that I do. I can think of all kinds of wonderful things. I can listen to all kinds of wonderful music and hope that my monkey brain knew to stop at all the red lights and obey all the speed limits. But then, you know, you have cruise control, and you got mine will beep at me if I take my hands off the wheel. And if I get too close to another car, it'll beep at me. If I start to stray off the road, it'll beep at me. I wonder sometimes, you know, you see other, I see other people driving. I won't say you do, but I see other people driving and I go, you're not paying attention to your driving. That's because they're in autopilot mode. And they're fine in their own bubble, but they're not paying any attention to the real traffic path. They're in a lane that is gonna take them twice as long to get where they're going because they don't realize that the other lane is free and clear. So how many times
have I been dangerous on that autopilot? But it's so comforting because I know exactly where to go. It's like, have you ever said to yourself, I don't even have to tell the car where to turn? It just does it automatically. It's not the stress and the pressure that there is when you're driving to a strange place and you don't know how long it'll take you to get there and you don't understand how the turns and the twists in the roads go. I have this one pretty much memorized, my path. It's a really easy, easy path of commuting. Um, the first gaze that you have is very seldom compassionate. It's too busy weighing and feeling for itself. How will this affect me? How does my self-image demand that I re react? How can I get back in control of this situation? We feel our, for our own feelings before we can relate to the situation and the emotion of the other. God teaches us how to live with the emotion of the other. And we can immediately, or at least more quickly, stand by and for the other and for the moment. Richard Rohr says it has taken him much of his life to get to the second gaze. By nature, he says, he has a critical mind and a demanding heart, and he's very impatient. And these are both his gifts and his curses, but he knows he can't have one without the other. He can't risk losing touch with his angels or his demons because they are both good teachers for him. The practice of solitude and silence allows them both and helps lead him to his second gaze. The gaze of compassion, looking at it life from a place of divine intimacy, is really all that he has, all that he has to give, even though he admits that he doesn't always even do that. In the second gaze, critical thinking and compassion are finally coming together. You know, it was in the second gaze on Friday night that I was like, hmm, I think I have a gas can. I think it would be fairly safe. I think there are people here. They can protect the restaurant. I can go home. And there's little, very little risk to this situation. I was able to, like, use not my monkey mind, but think through it very carefully. Now, when I got down and we, and he put the gas in and realized that it wouldn't start because they'd been there for hours using the power on the car to be comfortable. <laughs> and uh, they're at the top of the hill and I'm at the bottom of the hill and he's like, well, we need a jump. And so I had jumper cables, but I did not react in a first gaze situation because he's like, ah, uh, so because he's heading west, I'm thinking there's like, he says, you could just drive up the hill and park in front of me. And I'm like, mm, not thinking I'm gonna do that. And then he said, oh, we could push our car down the hill. And I'm thinking, oh, this is not going so good. <laughs> um, these ideas, ah, uh, may not work out so good. As Ken knows, you can get stuck in uh, on those hillsides. And I don't think he wanted to deal with more ruts in the hillside either. So I decided at that point to, I called up and uh, Ken Burleson came down. I asked him to come up there. I said, if we're gonna be putting cars together to do some kind of uh, jump, I'm not going to drive one of these vehicles to do that. But if you, I trusted him, if he, if he thought it was safe, okay, I would let him drive my car, but I wasn't going to do that. Fortunately, the tow people called, they called again, and the company said we're only 10 minutes out. And so we're at 10 minutes out. I took my jumper cables back. I said, 10 minutes, they can wait, they could wait 10 minutes. And I said, I'll be up at the restaurant for more than 10 more minutes. 
So if you need my jumper cables, I couldn't imagine a tow truck coming without a way to start a car. So, but I thought, so. Anyway, I saw when the tow truck came, I peeked out the door and saw that it had come. And before they left, they came by the door. They wanted to talk to me one more time and you know, express all, all the appreciation for helping them out, using the restroom and all that sort of stuff. So I just like, sometimes you can't just, when other people are excited and they want you to do crazy things, you can't just say, oh, I'm compassionate. I want to act for peace and justice and just jump on the bandwagon and do crazy things. I wasn't about to drive my car the wrong way down the highway. Uh, I wasn't about to drive my car straight up a hill or have them push a car down a hill. There's some things. Um, you have to use your critical thinking skills as well. But the second gaze will help you to see truthfully and fully it will help you to see the other. It will help you to see God, even God through God's eyes with eyes of compassion that will help you move in the direction for peace and justice. That doesn't mean you throw away your critical thinking skills in the process like the people did in Washington this week. Normally, you start with this dualistic thinking and then you move into a more enlightened response. So those two things have to be together. Hmm. Let us pray. Dear God, we've heard some things this morning we don't like. We've heard that we're sometimes responsible for other people's pain. We've heard that we're not always as compassionate as we could be. We've heard that sometimes we're controlled by a monkey mind that makes crazy decisions to protect ourselves. So God, help us. Help us to find and seek times of solitude and peace and silence so that we can sift through the veil and determine which of those things may or may not be true for us and how we might take control of who we are and whose we are and not always belong to this world. Be with us as we Enjoy our final song with you, God. Amen.